You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. At the same time, an entire brigade of enemy cavalry, consisting of four regiments, appeared just over the crest in our front. They were formed in column of regiments. To meet this overwhelming force, I had but one available regiment, the 1st Michigan Cavalry, and the fire of Battery M, 2nd Regular Artillery. I at once ordered the 1st to charge. Upon receiving the order to charge, Colonel Town, placing himself at the head of his command, ordered the trot and sabers to be drawn. In this manner, this gallant body of men advanced to the attack of a force outnumbering them five to one. In addition to this numerical superiority, the enemy had the advantage of position and were exultant over the repulse of the 7th Michigan Cavalry. All these facts considered would seem to render success on the part of the first impossible. Not so, however. Arriving within a few yards of the enemy's column, the charge was ordered, and with a yell that spread terror before them, the 1st Michigan Cavalry, led by Colonel Town, rode upon the front rank of the enemy, sabering all who came within reach. For a moment, but only a moment, that long, heavy column stood its ground. Then, unable to withstand the impetuosity of our attack, it gave way into a disorderly rout. I cannot find language to express my high appreciation of the gallantry and daring displayed by the officers and men of the 1st Michigan Cavalry. They advanced to the charge of a vastly superior force, with as much order and precision as if going upon parade. And I challenge the annals of warfare to produce a more brilliant or successful charge of cavalry than the one just recounted. Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer, Commanding Officer, 2nd Brigade, 3rd Cavalry Division, Army of the Potomac Cavalry Corps. We moved forward at a trot past Rummel's barn and engaged the mounted men at close range across a fence. Some of our troops, dismounting, threw down the fence and we entered the field. A short hand-to-hand fight ensued, but the enemy speedily broke and fled. Whilst pursuing them, I observed another body of the enemy approaching rapidly from the right to strike us in the flank and rear. I bore off in company with a portion of our men to meet and check this force. We soon found ourselves overpowered and fell back, closely pressed on two lines which converged at the barn. I was by General Stewart's side as we approached the barn. My horse fell at this point, placing me in danger of being made a prisoner. At this moment, General Hampton dashed up at the head of his brigade. He was holding the colors in his hand and passed them into the hands of a soldier at his side just as he swept by me. The charge of his brigade, as far as I could judge, was successful in driving the enemy back from that part of the field. Our brigade reformed on the edge of the woods in which it stood before the charge was made, and this position was held until we were quietly withdrawn at night. We were so near to the barn that I rode back to where my horse had fallen to secure, if possible, the effects strapped on my saddle. Later in the evening, I sent two of my men to the same spot to search for the body of Private B.B. Ashton of my company, who was supposed to have been left for dead on the field. Lieutenant G.W. Beale, 9th Virginia Cavalry, Chambliss's Brigade, Army of Northern Virginia Cavalry Division. 
Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode number 368 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the podcast. As y'all recall, we used the last show to talk about those seemingly random cannon shots that Jeb Stewart had fired from Crest Ridge, east of Gettysburg, on July 3rd, which we think were probably meant to provoke a response from the federal horsemen who were defending the nearby Hanover Road and Low Dutch Road intersection. Right. And those cannon shots essentially kicked off the ball here at East Cavalry Field on the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg. Because if Jeb Stewart was hoping to provoke a response from the Yankees over yonder, then he succeeded. The Confederate cannon shots stirred up George Custer and his Michigan horsemen. Custer quickly ordered his horse artillery battery to unlimber and engage the rebels across the way on Crest Ridge. Custer also sent forward the troopers of the 5th Michigan Cavalry, dismounted as skirmishers. The men of the 5th were armed with seven-shot Spencer repeating rifles, so they were perfectly suited for this type of duty since they could deliver firepower beyond their numbers. As the half-dozen three-inch ordnance rifles of Lt. Alexander Pennington's Battery M, 2nd United States Artillery, opened fire on the Confederate cannon on Crest Ridge, Jeb Stewart had his answer as to the federal strength and position because a battery of artillery meant the Yankees held the crossroads in force. Stewart ordered the men of Witcher's 34th Virginia Cavalry Battalion to dismount and come up on foot. They took up positions in the Rummel farm buildings, particularly the barn, and in the adjacent woods. Witcher's men were more mounted infantry than regular cavalry, and they were all armed with Enfield muskets, which made them ideally suited for the business of trading shots with the Yankee skirmishers. However, legend has it that Witcher's men entered the fighting here on July 3rd with only 10 rounds for their Enfields, and so in the end weren't of much use to Stuart. Although almost every account of the fighting here mentions the 10 rounds, a few of our sources say this was a myth and that, in fact, Witcher's men had full cartridge boxes that day at East Cavalry Field. It's just a small detail, but it shows the trouble you run into sometimes when you come across conflicting information during your research. Since we keep talking about the intersection of the Hanover Road and Low Dutch Road, you're probably wondering, hey, what's the big deal about that crossroads? Well, we're glad you asked. That quiet spot in the countryside, about three and a half miles east of Gettysburg, became an important crossroads because the Low Dutch Road connected the York Pike to the Hanover Road and beyond to the Baltimore Pike. As you guys will recall, the Baltimore Pike which passed over Cemetery Hill and ran just behind the federal position along Cemetery Ridge, was the Army of the Potomac's main line of communication and supply. And so, if the rebels could seize the intersection of the Hanover Road and Low Dutch Road, they could use that crossroads to potentially cause mischief and mayhem by threatening the Baltimore Pike. The Rummel Farm, which we just mentioned a moment ago, lay slightly more than a mile northwest of the intersection. The battle taking place at Gettysburg hadn't affected John and Sarah Rummel all that much, except for the brief presence of some Federal cavalry in the area on the afternoon of July 2nd. However, by mid-morning on July 3rd, the war had arrived at the doorstep of the Rummels and their neighbors. By mid-morning on July 3rd, federal horsemen in some force began appearing on the farm lanes and roads. They were the 1900 Michigan troopers of George Custer's brigade, comprising the 1st, 5th, 6th, and 7th Michigan Cavalry regiments. At just 23 years of age, Custer was the youngest brigadier general in the armies of the United States. He had been in command of the brigade only since June 29th, 
Custer was last in his class at West Point, the second class to graduate in 1861. So to say that his rise from staff officer to general had been nothing less than astonishing is a bit of an understatement. It happened because the orders placing George Meade in command of the Army of the Potomac also gave him a free hand to, quote, appoint to command any officers you may deem expedient, end quote. So when the Army's cavalry chief, Alfred Pleasanton, asked for permission to promote three promising young officers, taking them in one jump from captain to brigadier general, Meade agreed, and so on June 29th, those three promising young officers, Elon Farnsworth, Wesley Merritt, and George Custer were made generals. In his book, Gettysburg, Day 3, Jeffrey Wirt writes that when the Michigan cavalrymen, quote, first viewed their new commander, they were not sure what to make of him. He wore a uniform of black velvet trimmed with gold lace, a wide-collared blue navy shirt with silver stars sewn at the points of the collar, a wide-brimmed black felt hat, and boots with gilt spurs. A bright red necktie completed the outfit. This resplendent uniform was unmistakable in combat or on the march, as Custer had intended it to be when he had it made. But Custer had quickly dispelled his men's doubts about his youth and his ability at Hanover on June 30th and at Hunterstown on July 2nd, where he personally led an attack down a narrow, fenced-in road and had a horse killed under him. The men saw that he would fight and do it in the forefront. How Custer and his regiments of Michigan cavalry came to be covering the intersection of the Hanover and Low Dutch roads on July 3rd is something of a story in and of itself. You see, that spot had been held by the Federal Horsemen of David Gregg's Cavalry Division. As we've mentioned previously, Gregg's men had taken part in the fighting for nearby Brinkerhoff's Ridge just the day before. Some of that fighting had been witnessed by Jeb Stewart, which probably planted the idea in Stewart's mind to seize the important intersection, and so set the stage for the epic struggle here on the 3rd. Right. Then, on the Federal side, after dark on the night of the 2nd, after the fighting for Brinkerhoff's Ridge had ended, David Gregg had pulled his men back to the intersection of the Hanover and Low Dutch roads, and then from there they rode on to a position on the Baltimore Pike in rear of Culp's Hill. But leaving that important intersection behind the Federal Army's right flank uncovered nagged at Gregg's mind. So much so that when early on the morning of July 3rd, Alfred Pleasanton reaffirmed his instructions for Gregg to remain where he was in rear of Culp's Hill, the alarm bells in Gregg's head started ringing. He recognized that obedience to Pleasanton's orders would leave the Hanover and Low Dutch Road intersection dangerously uncovered, which Gregg considered a recipe for disaster since that spot provided a route straight into the rear of the Army of the Potomac's position at Gettysburg. So, he immediately sent an aide to Pleasanton's headquarters, pointing out the importance of the crossroads and how perilous it was to leave that spot unguarded. Pleasanton's reply reaffirmed the earlier order, but also gave David Gregg the discretion to call on one of the brigades from Judson Kilpatrick's cavalry division and have it cover the intersection. Kilpatrick's two brigades had spent the night at two taverns, about five and a half miles southeast of Gettysburg. His tired troopers hadn't set up their bivouac until nearly four in the morning, had slept for a few hours, and were caring for their mounts, or eating breakfast, when a courier from Pleasanton arrived about 8 a.m. The courier carried a message instructing Kilpatrick to take his two brigades toward the Federal left, near Little Round Top. In response to that order, Kilpatrick had actually already set out with one of his brigades, Farnsworth's brigade, when another courier rode in, this one with a message from David Gregg. 
Using the discretion granted to him by Pleasanton, Gregg was going to have one of Kilpatrick's brigades move to the Hanover Road and Low Dutch Road intersection. And since Custer's brigade hadn't moved out yet and was still there in camp when the order from Gregg arrived, well, the duty fell to Custer and his wolverines. Custer got his troopers moving, and after arriving at the unguarded intersection, deployed his regiments below the Hanover Road, facing northwest toward Crest's Ridge and the Rummel Farm. The scouts he sent out reported that all was quiet and there was no sign of the enemy. As we already know, though, that changed when Jeb Stewart and his Confederate horsemen arrived on the scene. George Custer and his Wolverines almost missed the battle at East Cavalry Field. That's because David Gregg received an order from Pleasanton directing him to relieve Custer's brigade at the Hanover and Low Dutch Roads intersection and send him, that is Custer, to rejoin Kilpatrick on the Army's left flank. About the same time that Gregg received that order from Pleasanton, he also received a message from 11th Corps Commander Otis Howard informing him that the Federals on Cemetery Hill had spotted a large force of rebel horsemen on the move. Howard's message said that, quote, large columns of the enemy's cavalry were moving toward the right of our line. Gregg kept his cousin Colonel J. Irvin Gregg's brigade along the Baltimore Pike as support for the main Federal line, but directed Colonel John McIntosh to take his brigade and to relieve Custer. McIntosh's troopers started out shortly before noon, followed by David Gregg. When McIntosh arrived at the Hanover Road and Low Dutch Road intersection around 1 p.m., he met with Custer, who filled him in on what was going on there. Custer had received the order to rejoin Kilpatrick on the Army's opposite flank and was only waiting for McIntosh to arrive before he and his Michiganders moved out. McIntosh had with him three regiments and a company, the 1st New Jersey, 3rd Pennsylvania, 1st Maryland, and Company A of the Purnell Legion, Maryland Cavalry. He also had Captain Allenson Randall's batteries, E and G, 1st United States Artillery. As Custer and McIntosh discussed the situation at the intersection, the massive Confederate artillery bombardment that preceded Pickett's charge kicked off its thunder rumbling and boiling and crashing west from Seminary Ridge and Cemetery Ridge toward the cavalrymen. A trooper from Pennsylvania later recalled how, quote, the very ground shook and trembled and the smoke of the guns rolled out of the valley as though there were thousands of acres of timber on fire, end quote. A North Carolinian in Stewart's command called the cannon fire, quote, the most incessant and terrific that I ever heard. David Gregg arrived as McIntosh was deploying his men and as Custer's wolverines prepared to mount and ride off. According to Gregg's subsequent account, when he rode up, Custer told him, General Gregg, you're going to have a big fight on your hands today. The woods beyond are full of the enemy. Gregg was sure Custer was right and he was also certain that he'd need every available man for the fight that was brewing here. So he proposed that Custer stay, rather than moving off to rejoin Kilpatrick over on the Army's opposite flank. Custer told Gregg he'd be happy to stay put if Gregg would give him the order to do so. Gregg promptly did just that, and as he stated in his report, Custer, quote, was well pleased to remain with his brigade. To meet the threat posed by the Confederate cavalry's presence over across the way, David Gregg set about raising the stakes by reinforcing Custer's skirmish line and challenging the rebels to an artillery duel. By that time, Jeb Stewart had brought up nine cannon and positioned them on Crest Ridge. On the Federal side, four of Randolph's guns joined Pennington's in trading shots with the Confederate cannon. 
From the start, it was an uneven contest, as Randall's and Pennington's well-handled pieces threw shot and shell at Crest Ridge. Captain Randall would later declare, quote, As a rule, their horse artillery was so badly handled in battle, we artillery officers paid but little attention to it, end quote. A Virginia cavalry officer would say that here, at East Cavalry Field, quote, The artillery we used seemed of little service, and I think most of it was soon silenced by the Federals. Meanwhile, McIntosh ordered the 1st New Jersey to advance on foot against the rebels holding the Rummel Farm. Those were Witcher's men from the 34th Virginia Battalion, and from behind a stone wall, they opened fire on the New Jerseyans who had halted at a rail fence. As the Virginians and New Jersey troopers traded shots from behind the stone wall and rail fence, the men of the 5th Michigan moved up on the left of the New Jerseyans, adding the fire of their Spencers to the mix. While from the west side of Little's Run, four companies of the 6th Michigan also armed with Spencers, fired into the right flank of Witcher's position. Jeb Stewart reacted to this federal pressure by sending forward four companies each from the 14th and 16th Virginia to reinforce Witcher's position along the stone wall. As they moved up to the wall, Lieutenant William Gaines of the 14th Virginia stopped to help one of Witcher's men who had been wounded, but the man growled, Damn you, go on into the fight. I will be dead in a few minutes. On the federal side, behind the Michiganders and New Jerseymen, six companies of the 3rd Pennsylvania moved forward on foot, adding their firepower to the struggle. Both David Gregg and Jeb Stewart had now added more men to the lively fight that had developed here at the Rummel Farm and along Little's Run but with the dismounted troopers of both sides fighting with equal tenacity, neither side could gain an advantage. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. When Jeb Stewart approached the Hanover Road and Low Dutch Road intersection on July 3rd, His plan was to fix the enemy in place with aggressive dismounted skirmishing in the neighborhood of the Rummel and Lott Farms. Then, from the concealment of Crest Ridge, move a portion of his command into place so as to strike the Federals' left flank. But the Federal skirmishers pushed back so hard that Stewart's strategy was derailed. So he decided to go with Plan B. He'd clear out the Yankees with a mounted charge instead. To that end, he ordered forward his old command, 
the 1st Virginia Cavalry of Fitz Lee's Brigade. As the Virginians rode forward, entering the fields east of the Rummel Farm buildings, charging into the gap between Little's Run and the Low Dutch Road, they caught the 1st New Jersey and 5th Michigan in the midst of pulling back after they'd run low on ammunition. The Federals scattered, running for their horses and for safety. The Federal artillery redirected their fire toward the charging 1st Virginia, but the center of the battlefield had been swept clear of organized Yankees, and to Jeb Stuart, looking on from Crest Ridge, the charge of his old regiment looked irresistible. Captain William Miller of the 3rd Pennsylvania, watching the Confederates, admitted, quote, a more determined and vigorous charge than that made by the 1st Virginia, it was never my fortune to witness. That may have been true, but David Gregg moved quickly to counter the threat, ordering Custer to counterattack with the 7th Michigan, which had been kept in reserve south of the Hanover Road. At the clash at Hanover, Pennsylvania on June 30th, the 7th Michigan had been briefly engaged, but, wrote Lieutenant John Clark, quote, not enough to satisfy my curiosity, as the Rebs were disposed to keep at too great a distance. I had a curiosity to participate in a battle and to know what it was to charge upon the enemy. Within minutes, Lieutenant Clark's curiosity would be satisfied. As the 7th Michigan moved forward, suddenly George Custer appeared at the head of the regiment. Custer was nothing if not ambitious, and he viewed leading men in battle as a great opportunity for fame. However, he was also fearless, and he wouldn't ask his men to go where he wouldn't lead them. Taking off his hat and drawing his sword and pointing it toward the enemy, Custer turned in his saddle and shouted, Come on, you wolverines! The charge of the 1st Virginia had taken them up to a sturdy rail fence that ran eastward from Little's Run, blocking their further advance, and it was there that the 7th Michigan's charge also came to a halt. An officer of the 5th Michigan, watching the collision at the fence line, said it was, quote, like the waves of the sea upon a rocky shore until all were mixed in one confused and tangled mass. Hundreds of Virginians and Michiganders were face to face at point blank range, each on their side of the fence, using sabers, pistols, and carbines in a frenzy of close combat. Lieutenant Clark summed up the churning, furious fighting by saying, quote, It was kill all you can, do your best, each for himself. Custer's horse was hit, so he borrowed a bugler's mount. Some of his men dismounted and knocked down sections of the fence. Through the gaps charged the rest of the Yankees. The breakthrough scattered the Virginians, who bolted for safety. The men of the 7th Michigan pursued the rebels, but coming toward them were more mounted Confederates. The 9th and 13th Virginia of Chambliss's brigade, the 1st North Carolina and Jeff Davis Legion from Wade Hampton's brigade, and squadrons of the 2nd Virginia from Fitz Lee's brigade. Those rebels were all riding forward because Jeb Stuart had realized his attempt to reach the intersection had almost succeeded with a charge by only a portion of his command, so he decided an all-out attack by a larger force would be able to score a breakthrough and drive the Yankee horsemen from the field. This next phase of the fighting, starting with the sweeping, thunderous charge by these Confederate horsemen, would be the climax of the battle here at East Cavalry Field on July 3rd. Captain Miller of the 3rd Pennsylvania would say, quote, A grander spectacle than their advance has rarely been beheld. They marched with well-aligned fronts and steady reins. Their polished saber blades dazzled in the sun. All eyes turned upon them. Meanwhile, in their pursuit of the 1st Virginia, the men of the 7th Michigan had reached another fence that ran along a farm lane that connected the Rummel House with the Low Dutch Road. Stopped by that barrier, they suddenly found themselves assailed from the front and both flanks by this overwhelming Confederate counterattack. It was now the Michiganders' turn to retreat and race for safety. 
The seventh's Lieutenant Clark, who had wished to see what it was like to take part in a battle, confessed in a letter, I had my curiosity fully gratified, and have not hearkened for a fight since, and do not think I should if I never participated in another. The Confederates pursued the fleeing 7th Michigan until their charge was stopped by Federal artillery fire and by a counterattack by four companies of the 5th Michigan, which struck the right flank of the Confederates. With that, the rebels turned and withdrew toward Crest Ridge. For a few minutes, it seemed as if both sides had had enough, but then from behind Crest Ridge appeared more Confederates. It was the remaining units from Wade Hampton's brigade, except for the Cobb Legion, which didn't join the attack. Hampton admitted the sight of these men riding forward came as a quote-unquote surprise to him. You see, he was busy reforming the 1st North Carolina and Jeff Davis Legion when a staff officer mistakenly ordered in the rest of the brigade as a support for Chambliss. Well, this wasn't what he had in mind for his command, but Hampton decided in for a penny, in for a pound, and placed himself at the head of this new attack. Across the way, the Federal artillerymen again rammed charge after charge into their guns, trying to stop this new enemy attack. Lieutenant James Chester, commanding the section of Randall's battery that was engaged here, was a bit busy when a staff officer from David Gregg rode up with orders to withdraw his guns. "'Tell the general to go to hell,' replied Chester." who admitted later that, in the heat of the moment, he was not, quote, in a cheerful humor, end quote. <laughs> the, the Federal gunners switched to canister as the enemy came on steadily, but one Pennsylvanian said that the rebel horsemen closed the gaps in their lines created by the blasts of canister, quote, as if nothing had happened. Chester claimed that the enemy got so near his guns, quote, that I could hear their commands, and see the buttons on their uniforms. However, coming up from the rear of the Federal batteries, the 1st Michigan was advancing to the attack. That's because when David Gregg saw Hampton's rebel horsemen charging, he knew it was yet another moment of crisis. So he dashed over to the 1st Michigan's commanding officer, Colonel Charles Town, and ordered Town to counter the Confederate thrust. The 35-year-old town was actually suffering dreadfully from the end stages of tuberculosis. Even though he was sick and terribly weak, he had refused to leave his command. Now, here at East Cavalry Field, with a voice that was little more than a raspy whisper, Charles Town ordered his men to draw sabers and advance. George Custer, as he had with the 7th Michigan, would also join the 1st Michigan as they attacked the enemy. Joining town at the head of the regiment, Custer spurred his horse into a gallop with the rest of them as a bugler sounded the charge. Hampton's oncoming Confederates also weren't slowing down in the least, and when the two sides collided, one witness said the noise was, quote, like the falling of timber. As the opposing forces crashed into each other at the gallop, horses cartwheeled to the ground, hurling their riders into the air. Some men were crushed beneath their dying mounts or trampled in the wild melee. For those men who kept their saddles, it was a fierce, savage struggle, yelling, shouting, saber ringing against saber, pistols discharged directly into chests and faces. From the Confederate right, a handful of troopers from the 3rd Pennsylvania, along with McIntosh's headquarters group, charged toward the flag of the leading rebel unit. Captain Walter Newhall of McIntosh's staff went directly at the enemy colors. As Newhall reached for the prize, a Confederate shot him in the chin. The bullet exited his cheek. This group of Federals numbered probably fewer than 30 officers and men, and half of them fell here in this desperate struggle around the enemy flag. From Hampton's opposite flank, Captain William Miller's detachment of the 3rd Pennsylvania entered the fighting. Miller's men had been posted as skirmishers in the woods north of the Lot House. However, now, watching this latest round of fierce fighting in the fields to his front, and realizing he had an opportunity to strike the enemy in the flank, Miller couldn't stand to be a spectator any longer and had his men mount up. 
Miller's orders had been to hold the woods, so he asked his two lieutenants if they would support him if he were court-martialed for disobedience. When they said they also thought they should charge the enemy, Miller had the men form ranks. He later said, quote, The men were restive, and before I gave the order, they started to charge. Captain Miller's nearly 100 troopers emerged from the woods and hit the left flank of Hampton's force like a thunderbolt. One of the Pennsylvanians said that as they attacked, it appeared as if the head of the enemy column, quote, seemed to fray at the edges, and the current, like an eddy, seemed to be running back. Hit hard from front and flank, the Confederate attack had been broken. The rebels turned and, according to one witness, began, quote, sweeping to the rear, end quote. As his men fell back, Wade Hampton had a close call that nearly cost him his life when he was caught with a fence at his back as Federal horsemen closed in, hacking and slashing, cutting him twice, very badly, across the head. Finally, a sergeant in the 1st North Carolina came to Hampton's rescue, allowing the general to jump his horse across the fence and escape. Michiganders and Pennsylvanians chased the retreating rebels, but stopped their pursuit at the Rummel Farm buildings. As Miller, who was wounded in the arm during the fighting, was making his way back, he met McIntosh, who congratulated the captain on his attack. Far from being court-martialed as he'd feared, William Miller would be awarded the Medal of Honor for his initiative and personal bravery on July 3rd at the battle at East Cavalry Field. This time it was finished. Jeb Stewart had played his last card and he now broke off the action after the repulse of Hampton's charge. All told, the battle at East Cavalry Field had lasted about three hours, with the bulk of that time spent in dismounted skirmishing. The mounted charges and countercharges had lasted perhaps 45 minutes. In all, the Confederates suffered 181 casualties, while the Federals lost 254 men. Custer's Wolverines accounted for 219 of the Federal casualties. Jeb Stewart waited until darkness fell before pulling back to the York Pike. Both sides claimed victory, and while the fighting itself may have ended in a tactical draw, there can be little argument that, in the end, big picture, the Federals came out on top. On July 3rd at East Cavalry Field, the efforts of Custer's and McIntosh's brigades thwarted Jeb Stewart's plans and secured for the Federals the important Hanover Road and Low Dutch Road intersection. He may have come out the loser here, but ne nevertheless, credit goes to Jeb Stewart, considering the fact that, with the exhausted men and failing horses from the three brigades who had, had accompanied him on his ride up into Pennsylvania, he could even mount any sort of serious offensive action at all on July 3rd. However, that being said, Stuart was clearly outgeneraled by David Gregg on July 3rd, with Gregg making sound decisions and employing good tactics to guide the Federal cavalry to victory. Indeed, the performance of the Army of the Potomac's mounted arm had been improving for months, as demonstrated at Brandy Station, at Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville, and then at Hanover three days earlier. David Gregg summed up his victory at East Cavalry Field by noting, quote, General Stewart had in view the accomplishment of certain purposes. His was to do, ours to prevent. If he could have reached the rear of our army, disastrous consequences might have resulted. And then we'll let the final word go to a trooper of the 7th Michigan, who wrote to his brother after the battle that, quote, I was very anxious to have one big fight before the war should end, and that fight I got at Gettysburg. I never want to see another one. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, but our recommendation this time isn't a book, or even a video recommendation like last time. No, our recommendation this time is... Well, we want to put in a plug 
for the licensed battlefield guides at Gettysburg National Military Park. We've never toured the battlefield with a licensed guide, but have heard from plenty of folks that it's a great experience and something they're glad they did during their visit to Gettysburg. If you aren't familiar with the licensed battlefield guides, they have to go through a rigorous testing and selection process by the National Park Service before they receive their license. So they really know their stuff and aren't just some yahoos doing a podcast like us. Uh, They're professional and knowledgeable and will even personalize your tour so you can request a focus on a specific spot or event like, for example, the fighting here at East Cavalry Field on July 3rd. Anyway, if you'd like more information on hiring a licensed battlefield guide, you can visit gettysburgtourguides.org. And to book a reservation with a guide, call 717-337-1709. We'll put that info up on our website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. Also at the website, you can find links to the show's Facebook page, Twitter feed, and Instagram account, as well as contact information and information about joining the Strawfoot Brigade over on Patreon. Speaking of which, we want to say thank you to the newest members, Robert M., Jim T., Brady W., Kenny C., Andre S., and Harry M. Penny, Brad S., Jim W., Dennis S., Sherry M., and Kate K. And thanks to ER and also Jim M. for their donations. Yep, thanks everyone. We appreciate your support. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope that you'll join us again next time when we'll start to talk about the preparations on the Confederate side for Pickett's Charge. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.